welcome everyone to 21 Acres. Uh, we're gonna be starting shortly with uh, Fiona and her talk about Washington water rights and water conservation for homes. And I'd just like to start by talking about some announcements that we have. The first of which is our permaculture meetup events that we have. We have one coming up very soon. It's this weekend, and we invite everyone to join us. We'll be making a rocket mass heater. So if you're at all interested in rocket mass heater, there's information in the back table, and you can sign up for it. We have all the information here, and it's available also on that sheet of paper in the back. And we also have two other events with our permaculture meetup that we're that we have um, throughout the rest of the year the first or the second of which that was that's the first one the second is our meeting committee our planning committee which we'll be using to plan out our events for 2016 and this planning committee will be on November 18th which is the third Wednesday of this month and we encourage everyone to join us and if you haven't signed up already there is a sign up, sign up sheet out in the lobby if you'd like to sign up for that and the last announcement is the practical permaculture class with Jesse Bloom and Dave Bainline they're two local permaculture authors that recently published a book called Practical Permaculture. It's an amazing book. We have it here available to, if you'd like to check it out. And they'll be giving a really interesting permaculture class on December 2nd of, of this year. And it's basically going to be an entire permaculture design course all rolled up into one day. So if you have any interest in taking a permaculture design course, but aren't yet ready to commit to taking two weeks or three weeks or even a month or a year off to take a permaculture design course, you can just attend this event that we have on December 2nd and get a really good idea of what a permaculture design course is all rolled into one day. And you get to do it with some really articulate, really amazing permaculture authors that are local to this area here. So I think it's a great opportunity. And we also have a permaculture, um, we have permaculture activities that are ongoing here. And I, I am involved with the volunteers and I help people get coordinated with projects associated with permaculture. So if you're at all interested and getting involved with permaculture here on site at 21 Acres, feel free to contact me. My email is scott at 21acres.org. And now I'm gonna hand it over to Eric, who um, I think is busy with the registration right now, but he, he might be um, coming in at some point soon <laughs> to talk about a little bit more about the event that we have tonight and also share uh, an interesting story that he has. And uh, sure. without further ado. Hello. Um, a couple of you guys, my name is Eric Goheen and I'm an organizer here at 21 Acres. Um, some of you guys may be wondering why we have this huge uh, array of screens and lights and cameras and things. Um, we're simulcasting this uh, event tonight to uh, households all over the country or the world, theoretically. Um, we've been uh, working to develop uh, a, a way to communicate our ideas and share our ideas uh, across a large geographic scope um, without people having to um, travel long distances to see this. Uh, there are some people who live on the islands and on the other side of um, the Puget Sound that really wanted to uh, get this content. Uh, and so uh, we're working uh, to develop uh, this programming and um, welcome to all of our visitors in uh, uh, the other homes. Um, what I wanted to say uh, quickly about 
why we chose this content um, for tonight um, is uh, I am a gardener um, and I have a garden um, here in Seattle and Kenmore um, and we have municipal water supply and all uh, summer long I could water my crops, uh, water my plants as needed uh, and the only real effect that it had on me was my water bill rising. But I also have a garden in uh, Whatcom County on a well. Um, I garden about 2,000 square feet uh, with a friend of mine. Uh, he turns the hose on every couple of days and um, I go up every third weekend and weed uh, all of the garden and um, you know, harvest the plants and, and bring them home, freeze them, process them uh, as needed. And it's a good partnership that I have um, to provide myself with food and him with food uh, throughout the winter. Um, and I just am curious if you guys have gardens uh, that are not on municipal water supplies. Anybody using a well or pulling water out of the river? Okay, so uh, one of the things that happened with me uh, and Fiona as well is our water pressure dropped and the wells that we had. Um, if you uh, have a public uh, a pea patch here um, in the Sammamish Valley, uh, you would know, or you were working in the permaculture um, nursery that we have, you'd also know that the water table dropped um, during the high months of summer uh, and we lost water pressure. And people who were living in Edmonds and driving to Woodenville to harvest from their pea patch here couldn't water in high summer because the water table dropped. Um, there's also a couple of King County supported farmers um, who are working with King County Department of Agriculture, Agriculture Commission, um, to grow f cut flowers and they sell cut flowers at the Pike Place Market. Well, they ran out of water as well and their flowers were wilting. And so uh, in, in partnership with King County, they were actually driving tens of thousands of gallons um, every week into the fields uh, here, right here in the Sammamish Valley where we have the slough running through, um, but we need to quantify the amount of water um, that is in running in that river um, for salmon and other conservation purposes and um, it's water law really and our access to water is um, you know, really crucial to uh, understanding how we can use the resources that are around, um, around us. Uh, so if, if you are a gardener or a farmer or an aspiring gardener or farmer and you're looking at land to buy or you're a real estate agent and you're looking to sell homes to people who want to be farmers or gardeners or use more, uh, more water than is uh, on the, the public supply or um, for a simple household uh, exempt well. Uh, knowing what the access rights to water is and what those invisible structures are um, that allow us to have a common uh, resource such as water. Uh, and so it's really important that we understand a little bit about water law. And, um, know how we can manipulate the law and how we can work with the law and how we can work within this institution and where we can work um, outside the institutions uh, to make sure that we're moving forward with um, a healthy and biodiverse ecosystem, that we're um, conserving water as is important and what ways we can use to conserve and recycle water where that's uh, applicable. And next month we're going to be talking a little bit about gray water systems and improving um, the, our ability to recycle water and, uh, and use water twice uh, where it is possible. Um, so I want to introduce uh, Fiona Douglas Hamilton who uh, teaches courses um, on water rights law and other uh, real estate oriented organizations. Um, she's a great speaker and I'm really excited to hear um, what she has to teach us about um, water rights and conservation for our homes. So please give uh, me a hand and warm welcome for Fiona Douglas Hamilton. Thanks, Eric. First of all, I have to um, immediately say I am not the water rights expert. Um, John Rose um, at the back of the um, room, who's from the Department of Ecology, is the water rights expert, and he's going to um, illuminate you all. My background is in construction. Um, I've been a contractor and um, involved in the whole property development world for about the last 30 years. And I've seen the practices we do um, have a massive impact on the soil structure and then also how we design. Um, 
can have a massive effect on how long it takes us to deliver water, so we waste water, and how, how, much water it how much it takes to heat, so how much energy. So today's, this evening, and again, we're not able, um, we're able to do this because of Cascade Water Alliance, who is an education partner of ours. Um, SEEK is a green real estate uh, engagement, education, and valuation firm. And people always go, why do you say, why was it called SEEK? Well, social, environmental, and economic consulting, the three underpinnings of sustainability. So this was, as I say, this was, has been abbreviated from um, some continuing education classes we put together for real estate brokers. So I want to get just a quick gauge who are brokers in the room and we got one. A soul broker, Rosalind. <laughs> <laughs> You're amongst friends. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, well, that's great. And the, the rest of you are par part of the permaculture meetup. Wonderful. So there are definitely going to be things that you're very aware of about water, but um, we also are, as you know, broadcasting to other folks who don't have this um, expertise. So I'm an educator, I'm a communicator, and one of the things that we are doing with the Citizen Series is the idea of starting to bring awareness around sort of what I call trending issues uh, for real estate ownership. That can be, and I, obviously, one of the biggest trending issues I think facing us, not just in Western Washington, but so many states within the United States and also the world, is this issue around water, water availability, social justice issues around water availability and access. And so what we're going to do is sort of bring together these small one to two hour talks that we can broadcast out and eventually get um, people more and more informed because when we're informed, we then have a choice. And I believe that passionately as, a, as an educator and also as a consumer, that if we don't have the information, we can't know and we can't make the right choices for ourselves, for our families, for our communities, and for eventually uh, you know, the planet. I'm not used to having this fine screen in front of me, so I shall now keep my head permanently this way. <laughs> so the context, and I love this picture because it, tes it says it all. We are a planet of water. So what are we doing? Why are we even worrying about water conservation? You know, you guys know. Because, and here's the amazing thing about our planet of water, that what we actually have is that all of this is, 71% of that is, um, of the surface, is water. 29% of the rest of it is made up of continents. Now, what about that makeup of water? Well, we sit there and think, that's fine, we have plenty of water, except that 97% is actually saline. Um, I hope none of us are ever uh, shipwrecked, because they will say, don't drink the water. <laughs> don't drink seawater. It will it'll make you crazy. So here we have this massive amount of water, saline water around us. And yet we, when we look at what is the fresh water that's actually available to us, it's 3%. Now let's break that 3% down a little bit more, and we've got a whole 68, almost 69% caught up in glaciers, we hope. <laughs> I say that, but <laughs> with the ir irony. Um, and then, an so out of that then 3%, we've got 69% uh, in glaciers, we've got about 30% then available to us in groundwater. It's starting to look like not a lot that's available. And then we've got other, and that other, then turns out to be in lakes, then divided 87%, and then swamps and rivers. Wow. I remember showing my brother this next. I was talking to him, and <coughs> I love my family. We we're absolutely divided between the dominant capitalist and um, the, uh, the environmentalists on the side. So we have terrific arguments at times, and it's all quite good-natured. 
until we actually had the conversation about water. And I said, well, do you realize, James, that actually, I showed him this next diagram. I said, actually, that is what this is the total volume, the bigger bubble is the total volume of all of our water in comparison to the volume of Earth. And then that wee, wee little dot is the total volume of fresh water. I think every child should look at this, every adult, because this is an incredibly precious substance that we can do many things without. We can go quite a long time without food. It's not very pleasant, but we go nowhere after three days without water. And water is a right that all species have, act, should have access to, equal. And I know John is going to, uh, this is kind of a nice lead up into John because uh, normally I, I talk for longer and then John comes along and then I talk some more. But this time I said, John, I'm just throwing you in there. I'm going to give, give it to, um, so I want you to welcome John Rose. He is going to really talk about this whole issue of accessibility to of our water resources that we own in common. And um, take it from there, John. So I just want to set up the context. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> Let's make sure we don't drink our drink your water. Drink your water, that's right. Okay. Uh, let me make sure. Okay. Um, well, Fiona just introduced me as the expert on water law, and uh, I have to tell you about a few years ago, I was talking to our um, our program manager who'd been in water resources for 35 years and had come to the conclusion there were no experts on water law. It's a very very complex subject, and actually today what I'm going to be talking about is two uh, distinct and separate but interrelated subjects. I thought because of the uh, intense public interest on the 2015 drought, I'd start off with that and talk about 20 minutes or so about the drought, how it developed, uh, what some of the impacts were, um, talk about what we may be seeing in the future, especially in 2016, and then what I'm going to also do uh, is talk also about water law, because the two are interrelated. As we for, uh, face increasingly um, complex issues over water, uh, potentially a scarcity of water and most importantly competition over water which has been growing over the past few decades, water law becomes more and more important even for the average everyday person. So just a quick overview of the 2015 drought is what I'll be covering. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about the historical um, development of water policy in Washington, how it came about. I'm going to be defining what water rights are, what water right permits, certificates and claims are. I'm going to be talking about that ever contentious issue known as permit exempt wells, um, the even more contentious issue about in-stream flow water rights, and then talk a little bit about how we assess um, obtaining a water right. What does ecology do when somebody uh, asks for new water for certain purposes? Um, talk about the fact that a water right can be relinquished, it can be abandoned, um, so it's not necessarily a right in perpetuity, and then finally, some existing and future challenges. Okay, let's see here, next slide. So I borrowed this slide, uh, actually I stole it from Fiona, gratuitously, maliciously, you name it. Um, but the thing is, is let's see, do I, have a, do I have a pointer on this? Button. Nope, that's not it. <laughs> I hope I didn't do something stupid. Okay, <laughs> there we go, okay. So, um, what this graph shows is basically a population projection over the next 15 years. And what it basically shows is we can expect about another million inhabitants in Washington state. And I'll be, I'll be honest with you guys, this is pre-California drought. We can expect a fair number of people who are going to say, I've had enough with the drought in California, I'm looking <coughs> elsewhere. So I think that this chart is actually obsolete. But the point is, is we're going to have a greater and greater need for water. Okay, but we also are facing increasing competition, as I mentioned before. Um, we have tribal issues in the state, and we have uh, tribes where 
they have already said that these tribes have the senior water rights uh, in the basins that they exist in. We also need to provide water for irrigation purposes and other human uses. We need to provide water for fisheries. And all that revolves around the idea of sustain, having a sustainable resource and a sustainable environment. And that really is a good segue into my next slide because, oh, no, actually, I take that back. Uh, we will talk more about that later. I want to talk about the drought now, OK? Um, and this is a really good graph that shows you how this all came about because this started off as an atypical drought. So uh, this is a graph showing precipitation and snowpack for Stevens Pass. This red line that you see, this faint red line here, this is the 30-year average of precipitation at Stevens Pass over a typical water year, which goes October 1st to October 1st. And as you can see, you know, we got about 90 inches of rain, you know, uh, in a typical year. And this r dark red line, which unfortunately only goes to April, I don't have the full um, uh, time period up to uh, uh, November 3rd. But as you can see, this darker red line was for 2015. So you can see that precipitation, because these red lines indicate precipitation, was just on track with the 30-year average. So we were getting the rainfall. But take a look at this lower area where, where I'm showing these blue lines. This lighter blue line is your 30-year average of snowpack. And as you can see, uh, it peaks around uh, April, mid-April, and we get an average of about uh, 35, maybe a little less than 35 inches of snowpack at Stevens Pass. But let's take a look at it this year. As you can see, we got nowhere near the snowpack. It peaked earlier, it peaked around February 1st, and then it began to decline. And what was happening? We had a warmer winter. And so it, on average, uh, temperatures were about four to five degrees warmer, and that meant it was coming down as rain, it wasn't coming down as snow. And that's really critical for us because the snowpack acts as a natural reservoir. It melts usually in the period between April through June, and it provides inflow into our reservoirs and into our rivers. And this is very critical because uh, many of our wildlife species are dependent upon that. Uh, case in point is our uh, steelhead. Uh, uh, the steelhead species actually spawns in that period between April through June. They've adapted to our river systems that have those higher flows due to snow melt. Okay, so. We started off with what was essentially a snowpack drought because that water wasn't going to be available for later in the year when we had our dry periods. Okay. Come on. There we go. So this is, gives you an idea of what type of temperatures we were facing. Uh, during that time period. This is the mean temperature for January. And what you can see is across the entire state, we had pretty much above normal temperatures. But look at where the most intense temperatures were happening. They were happening in the Olympic Mountains and in the Cascades. This was also very atypical. We traditionally have seen in the past droughts that have occurred basically in the central and eastern regions of Washington state. Instead, it was in the very areas where we expected to see our snowpacks accumulate. And this is uh, just January. We saw this uh, very typical, uh, this was very typical of December, of February, and of March. Hmm. Mm -hmm. My clicker is having problems. There we go. So, as you saw with that graph about Stevens Pass, it peaked about February. So this gives you an idea of the percentage of snowpack uh, that we had as of February 2nd when it reached that peak. So as you can see in the Olympic Mountains, we only had 16% of our normal snowpack, about 19% in the central Puget Sound region of our snowpack. We had an area that was very heavily impacted by this lack of uh, essentially a natural reservoir. So. What had began to happen is, is uh, we had our water supply committee uh, meet. This is uh, formed of local, federal, and state agencies who look at the amount of water supplies that we have in the f upcoming year. Um, and we began to do a series of rolling uh, drought declarations for various regions across the state. However, 
by May 14th, this is what we had. We had 0% snowpack in the Olympics, 0% in the central Puget Sound region. And as you can see, almost the entire state was impacted by this. And so on the following day, the governor declared a statewide drought. So what happened during the summertime, guys? Mm -hmm. Very, very hot. Very, very little precipitation. We went from a snowpack drought to a real drought. And to give you an idea of the magnitude of this, between uh, basically June 1st and the um, last week of August, well, excuse me, the third week of August, we got less rain than Phoenix, Arizona. Phoenix got two inches of rain. We got 1.41 inches of rain um, in the central uh, Puget Sound region. And so we were in a true drought at that point. And some of you are already familiar with some of the impacts because they've been out in the media. Um, serious loss of some of our aquatic species runs. Uh, about 250,000 uh, sockeye lost in the Columbia River due to warm temperatures. Now, who would expect, expect the Columbia River to be a, what is called a thermal barrier, a heat barrier uh, to migrating salmon because it's so warm? That's just one of the many impacts. Oh, I have another slide where I'll be going over some of the other impacts, impacts to human health, impacts uh, to our economy. Okay, so um, I would have liked to have actually uh, had this slide a little bit later, but the rains have come back, right? Hey, what was this weekend like? It was a downpour. I was up on the Skagit River with uh, some friends. We almost reached flood stage on that river, and we certainly reached flood stage at some other rivers. So we're out of the drought, right? Well, it's not quite that simple. Uh, now, admittedly, this is for uh, oops. this is for October 27th, but as you can see, by October 27th, 68 percent of the state was still listed in extreme drought. This red area is considered extreme drought. Uh, this orange area is considered to be severe drought, and only about 9% of the state was considered to be in moderate drought. And the reason being is because we had this huge deficit of water. Uh, to give you an idea of one municipal water supplier, um, uh, Tacoma Water, 97% of their water comes from the Howard Hansen Reservoir. By July, 40% of that water supply was coming from emergency wells wells that they traditionally have not used. Um, and I'll be showing some other slides as well. The key thing about a drought is, is it isn't over until we come back to a more normal precipitation and snowpack regime. As some of you have probably heard, the meteorologists are saying that this is maybe one of the strongest El Ninos uh, of this uh, upcoming winter, that we have in this upcoming winter. What that means is we can expect warmer temperatures. We can expect possibly drier conditions during this winter. So uh, just a few days ago, the director of ecology, Maya Bellin, uh, announced uh, to, uh, that we can expect probably the drought conditions to extend into 2016. Okay, so essentially the idea that we're maybe out of uh, this drought, uh, at, th at least at this point, despite the rains that we've had, is essentially uh, not true and that we can accept, uh, anticipate a multi-year drought. And I'll have a few slides here that might uh, illustrate this. So this is the Chester Morris Reservoir. This is the main water supply for S Seattle and uh, surrounding communities. Here's the reservoir itself. This picture was taken approximately October 25th. This is what is called the masonry pool. Hmm, doesn't look like much of a pool, mm -hmm. does it? Um, for the, only the second time in history, what they've had to do is there's a, a um, overflow dam right here and under normal conditions that uh, the well, lake level in the Chester Morris Reservoir is high enough that it naturally overflows this dam and feeds into the masonry pool. As of October 25th, you see these little dots here? Those are pumps. Um, they are having to pump the water overland over that uh, dike and to fill the masonry pool, which then provides water to the city of Seattle. Only the second time they've ever had to do that in uh, the history of operating the system. The other time was in 1958. So again, some serious issues. Why is this? Because we've had, we've had rains. We had an intense amount of rainfall that last week of August. Well, we had never seen soil moisture <laughs> levels so low than this year. And literally the ground was acting like a sponge. It was just sucking up all that water and there was very little, if any, 
uh, water for surface water runoff or groundwater inflow into our lakes, streams, and rivers. Okay, so what are some of the drought impacts on watersheds? Um, so this is a monthly stream flow for June of 2015 compared to historical stream flows. And you see these uh, red areas right in here. Um, actually, this doesn't actually come out too well. There's even some brighter areas right down here. But these are essentially at 10 per less than or equal to 10% of the normal stream flows. So our streams were extremely low. Just to give you some numbers, uh, my area of expertise is the Skagit River Basin. Normally during August to June, we see uh, the uh, Skagit River running about 9,000 cubic feet per second. Now, I know that's a figure that most of you aren't familiar with. A cubic foot per second is equal to 450 gallons per minute. We saw that river at less than 5,000 cubic feet per second. I've never seen that before. It was absolutely amazing. And there were some fears that some of us uh, would be out there with shovels trying to dig channels for the migrating fish uh, come this time of year. So our, uh, there were serious impacts on our watersheds and our lake streams and, uh, and uh, river levels. Okay, to give you an idea of that, this is July 18th on the Tanaway River. It's running at eight cubic feet per second. Its normal range on that day is between 75 to 200 cubic feet per second, and the water temperature was almost 80 degrees. That's lethal to fish. They bake at that. Um, so again, part of the impacts of this drought. So what are some of the impacts on public health? Um, increased risk of wildfires. I don't really need to mention that to you guys, do I? Um, we all experience that. But it also disrupts our water treatment plants. The water is very hot, which needs to be, it needs to be treated. It also tends to be very turbid, so you have disruptions of your water treatment plants. Uh, that's an economic impact on us. You know, we have our increased our uh, particulates in the air because there's more dust. Uh, that, of course, is an air quality and human uh, health impact. Um, we have fish kills due to those higher water temperatures, like I mentioned before, and also migratory barriers. When there's no water there and all you have is maybe uh, a few rivulets between these disconnected ponds on these tributaries where the fish either live, migrate, uh, or spawn, then those are migratory bar barriers and they uh, essentially can end up dying there. Um, and then the decreased uh, water quality due to algae blooms and biotoxins. The rise in water temperature causes uh, these biotoxins and algae blooms to develop. So those are just a few of those impacts. Um, so it's something that we all need to take very, very seriously and look at uh, what we can do in the future uh, to ensure that we try and mitigate that. And the best way to do that is listen to the advice of the water purveyors um, that are in the area, the water providers. Uh, we are currently in a voluntary mode uh, for Seattle, uh, Tacoma, and Everett to reduce uh, water amounts by 10%, and that can uh, be very, very helpful. Um, we are in the voluntary stage. We do not want to go to the mandatory stage like the Californians have done. Okay, now I'm going to shift gears a little bit I'm going to now talk about Washington State water law. Um, if you have any questions, by the way, feel free to ask them at the end of the presentation. I should have started off with that. I'm sure there will be some questions about the drought. Um, I will tell you I'm not a meteorologist. I can't, I'm can't. not sure if I have all the answers. But um, now it's time to talk about this interrelated uh, subject because as water users, uh, whether you're in uh, the land use development industry, whether you're a realtor, whether you're in the permaculture, um, you need to know what the regulatory environment is so that you know what the opportunities and challenges are. So uh, you notice what I put up here? Balancing the needs of people and the environment for a sustainable future. That's ecology's water resources goal. It's a challenge. Um, as Fiona will tell you, I have had plenty of sleepless nights uh, over the past 12 months or so. Um, but what we're trying to do is basically ensure that we have that sustainable environment, that sustainable resource for future generations. Okay, so this is a little graph I put together. And as you can see from the bottom arrow right here, this is actually a timeline. So I have Western development or Western settlement right here. That's about 1850. And then over here would be actually present day. And uh, as the Washington water use and water law evolved, we were originally concentrated in, during this phase up until the 1970s. That 1971 date is a little arbitrary. 
we are concentrating on what we call allocation. In other words, water for human use. And our water law and our water traditions really didn't recognize the fact that water is a limited resource. There was an assumption that it would always be there. Um, now, since the 1970s, as we begin to realize the interactions between groundwater and surface water, uh, the needs of our, uh, aqua, uh, our ecosystems and such, we, we're now in transitioning to the idea of environmental sustainability. And as many people know, when you're in a transition phase, it can be really, really painful. It can be really, really um, argumentative. So that's the idea by how we're moving towards uh, different concepts regarding water. What I have down here is the basic philosophies under which we've operated in the past. So prior to 1917, when we first came up with our water code, we were following the idea of riparian use or the riparian doctrine. That idea is actually hardwired into our brains. Even though you may not have heard the term riparian use, you instinctively know what it is. In other words, if the water is on, adjacent to, or below your property, you have a right to use it, as long as you uh, don't, are not impacting, impacting, adversely impacting your neighbors. However, as we began to move into the West, settle in, uh, into the West, the problem was is that uh, we as, uh, as um, uh, settlers began to realize this really didn't work very well in the Western United States. In most of the parts of Western United States, the water is not nearly as evenly distributed or as abundant as it is east of the Mississippi. So we had to move eventually, it was a rather painful process, to the idea of prior appropriation. And I'm going to uh, fall in the uh, next slide as to exactly what that is. Okay, so here are two gentlemen sedately discussing their water rights over their shared irrigation ditch. This happens all the time, okay? People fight over the water constantly. The reason why you saw the rise of civilization in arid uh, regions such as uh, Mesopotamia and in Egypt was the fact that people were fighting over water and they had to come up with complex solutions uh, for society to thrive, survive, thrive and survive. But uh, this is really kind of puts the whole idea of water law in uh, a basic concept and that is in the West, Whiskey's for drinking and water's for fighting over. It's just what it is. And laugh now, guys, this is as funny as it gets. Because <laughs> we'll be doing that. But it's true. People are constantly fighting over water. I've been mentioning earlier that we're facing incre increasing competition over water. Uh, we're seeing new groups that are fighting over water. Uh, traditionally, tribes have not been involved in it because they've essentially been disempowered. We're seeing environmental groups that are uh, concerned about environmental impacts on this. And so the fighting is going to get even more intense. And it's not helped by the fact that much of our water law is really, really old. It's, the concepts go back a century. That world of a century ago doesn't exist. Okay. So a little bit more of the historical background. In Washington, uh, throughout all of the United States, water is owned in common. We all own it. The state manages it to, for two reasons. One is to maximize its beneficial use, and the other one is, to, ironically, to try and eliminate those conflicts over water. Are we always successful? Hardly. Um, in the Western Europe and Eastern United States, it adopted that riparian doctrine, as I mentioned to you uh, before. But in the Western United States, because of the lack of uh, water availability in many places, we adopted this idea of prior, approach, uh, prior appropriation. It's the underlying principle of water law. So what is it? Well, the, I, before we get into that, I want to ask the audience a question. And I know there's some folks out there um, who are watching this remotely. Just, you know, in your own mind, uh, give yourself an, uh, a chance to think about this and ask yourself, what would you an how would you answer this? So theoretically, Let's say I own a piece of land and I plan to build on it when I retire, okay? So nothing's built on it and I had a well drilled five years ago. Now, do I have a legal source to water or a legal right to water? Now, I've learned by giving this presentation that this is somewhat of a leading question, but let's see raising a hand. Who thinks that there's a legal right to water to this? Okay, I see three, uh, four, all right. Who says no? Okay, more people say no. Who says maybe? Yeah. <laughs> All right, you people are saying maybe. 
This answer may come as a surprise to you. Okay. The answer is not necessarily. Okay. A water. That's a that's a maybe. Yes, you're okay. I saw you raise your hand. The answer is not necessarily. Um, we think of that water is a property right, and that it's very uh, it's essentially like a land right. But in fact. Uh, when we established our water code in 1917, it said that a water right is only vested, it's only created when that water is put to beneficial use. Think about that. Think about that as I go through this presentation. This has some very, very serious consequences, okay? And when you have this type of situation, what it means is that you can have a piece of property, you can think of it, it might have value, but Again, the water is only uh, created when you put that water to beneficial use. Okay, so we've talk, I've talked about prior appropriation, but I haven't defined it. Now's the time to define it. The idea behind uh, prior appropriation is the term first in time, first in right. In other words, we create a hierarchy of water rights. A person comes along for, uh, and starts using water. Okay, they create a water right with a priority date. We, that's a, a term of art that we use. And so let's say I start using the water uh, on January 1st, 1955. And I establish that water right for certain amounts for a certain purpose. Somebody else comes along, my neighbor, so say it's Fiona here, and she creates a water right in 1985. Prior appropriation principle says, I get all, use all my water first before the junior person who created the water right, a water right later, gets to use theirs. Now, during a normal year, that's no big issue. Usually on the western side of uh, the Cascades, there's plenty of water available. But in times of water shortage or times of water conflict, when you have a political fight over water, which is, we're increasingly seeing in many parts of the state, that becomes a very serious issue. Um, so I might be able, I'm the winner in that sort of situation if Fiona can't use all her water because I've already had that senior water right. So that's really important. And we immortalize that idea, again, in that phrase, first in time, first in right. Now, what I, this all is in context with is our first uh, water uh, law, which came in in 1917, and it was our surface water code. So it just covered surface water bodies, rivers, lakes, and this sort of stuff. And it said, if you're going to be diverting water from those surface uh, water sources, you, you need to get a water right. You need to get a permit from the state. And it was originally a variety, wide variety of agencies, but it, nowadays it's the Department of Ecology. And again, when you uh, put in an application with us, that date of application, when we receive it, is the priority date if you are issued a water right by the Department of Ecology. The other thing is, is we recognize the fact that people were established water prior to 1917. They were doing it under that riparian <coughs> doctrine. And so we recognize that those were legitimate water rights. Um, but we also said that a water right is a pertinent, there's another term of art, it's attached to uh, that piece of land. So let's say you want it for a 40-acre parcel that you own. When, uh, if you get a water right from the Department of Ecology, it's attached to that piece of land. And so if you're living in eastern Washington, you can't simply pack up your bags and say, I'm moving to western Washington, I'm taking my water right with me. We can move around water rights, um, but it's got to be in the same aquifer, it's got to be in the same watershed, and you really you can't do it without the approval of the Department of Ecology. Okay, notice what I have in big letters here. Oops, sorry. Um, you cannot create a water right through illegal use. This is one of our biggest challenges. People don't, off, many people don't know about water law. They think of the riparian doctrine and say, hey, water's on or below or adjacent to my property, I'm going to use it. And they don't realize that they need to acquire a water right. So they start using the water. They may be using that water for decades, and then maybe a neighbor complains, saying, hey, you know, the person's draining my uh, well dry or something like that. And they say, hey, I, you know, I, I've, I'm entitled to a water right. And we say, well, you don't have a water right, you never filed for one, and we can't then make what was a non-legal use legal. And so there's no real grandfathering in. I'm going to be talking about water right claims, which is a sort of a spe separate issue, um, but the idea is, is, like I said, even though you may have been using the water for decades, it may have been, in, uh, been using on your property f uh, for, by your very grandfather, if you don't have a water right, we can't make you legal until you get a water right. 
Okay. So, um, 1917, we create that surface water code. It only ap applies to surface water. We didn't have one for groundwater, in other words, water pumped from wells, largely because the technology wasn't around to really dig deep wells at that time. But by 1945, that, that technology was around, and so we created a water right code. And it was supplemental to the surface water code, so it embraces those same ideas of prior appropriation. Okay? Um, so new uses for groundwater also need uh, a permit. They need a water right um, to use it with certain exemptions, okay? And this is one of the most controversial subjects in Washington State right now. For small water uses, um, they were exempt from the permitting process, and I'm going to go through what those exemptions are. Um, these are called permit-exempt wells. As we uh, increasingly face more and more competition over water, this issue of permit-exempt wells becomes more and more controversial. Um, I spend, I think, about 95% of my time dealing with uh, the uh, issues around permit exempt wells these days. So what are these permit exempt wells? So actually, I'm going to stop here and I'm going to recap. Um, I'm going to say, keep in mind that if you want to divert surface water, you need a water right. That is no, there's no exemptions, okay? You have to have a water right. Doesn't mean you can't buy a pre-existing water right. That's something you can also do. Um, you have to go through ecology to go through and change uh, uh, it if you're going to move it around or something like that. It's also true that you need a, a water right if you're going to be using groundwater with certain exemptions. And those exemptions are listed right here. And so if you're going to be using it for stock watering, you don't need a water right. Okay? Uh, if you're using a well, feel free, go ahead, use it for stock watering. Uh, notice there's no quantity limitations on that stock watering. This was created, this was a law that was created in 1945, and at that time, most people didn't have a large number of uh, cattle or horses. Now we have, you know, tens of, th uh, you know, uh, ranches that have 30,000 head of cattle. Um, for single or group domestic, not to exceed 5,000 gallons a day, you don't need a water right. Now, I have to stop and say, Nothing in water is, there's no hard and fast answers. This is true, there are some areas in Washington State because of uh, ongoing conflicts and legal cases where even this may not apply, okay? And if you have any questions, you can ask me later. Um, industrial uses also not to exceed 5,000 gallons per day, and irrigation of a non-commercial lawn or garden not to exceed half an acre in size. Those also don't need a water right. You just drill your well. You will, the well driller will be submitting a, what is called a notice of intent to drill a well with the Department of Ecology. But once you've paid that fee, you're free to use uh, water uh, for these amounts. Okay. So, however, um, as it's become increasingly harder and harder to get water rights because of these conflicts I've mentioned before, uh, we've had some people who've tried to do some funky things with permit-exempt wells. Um, but... Keep in mind that a permit exempt well is a water right. It's just like any other water right. The only thing it's exempt from is uh, that permitting process of going through ecology. Um, and the priority date of such a permit exempt well goes back to the beginning of the beneficial use of water, as I stated before. Okay, let's stop because uh, I have another question for you. Yes, audience participation. I like to keep everybody awake. Um, let's hypothetically say that I have 40 acres. And I've subdivided that 40 acres into one acre lots, okay? And I put a well on each of those uh, lots, okay? So, is each one of those lots entitled to that uh, permit exemption of 5,000 gallons per day up to an equal and half an, a half an acre of non-commercial lot in a garden? Yes? These are, now, it was once one parcel, now they're 40 individual parcels. There's a well on each parcel. Does each get uh, that permit exempt amount? Does they get 5,000 gallons per day? So this is like a long patch in like Thurston County? Yes, exactly. Okay. I would say maybe it's not one acre, maybe they were, mm, had to be five acre lots, but they were, each one had their own well. Yeah, each one has their own well. Yeah. So are they entitled to, like I said, each receiving 5,000 gallons a day for domestic purposes and half an acre of non-commercial ones? So. Okay. Everybody, okay. We see some raising hands? Okay. So this was decided in the Washington State Supreme Court. No. Surprisingly enough, um, it's one project. And how the Washington State Supreme Court interpreted it is, is one project gets one exemption. So it, you can have those 40 wells, 
but those, uh, the total amount of water being used from those 40 wells cannot exceed that 5,000 gallons per day for domestic or commercial use. And here, keep in mind, those 40 acres have to, can only irrigate up to a half an acre of non-commercial lawn or garden. This is what we call the Campbell and Gwynn decision. It's also a very controversial one. Um, but keep that in mind. And so, like I said, the exemption amounts apply to the whole project. Okay. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, people kind of do some funky things with the whole permit exemption process. Somebody says, oh, well, if I put on two wells, that means I can irrigate an entire acre, or four wells and I can irrigate two acres. No, it doesn't really work that way. Um, if, for example, one cannot irrigate two acres by installing four wells, just mention that, uh, or use 10,000 gallons per day by installing two wells. It's those uh, uh, amounts apply for one project. Okay. Um, so I've been talking about water rights, but I haven't defined them. So what is a water right? How do you define it? Okay, I'm going to just read off the slide here. By the way, everybody knows that the slide's actually for my purposes, not for yours, right? Okay, this is to keep me on the straight and narrow. Um, everybody's experienced death by PowerPoint before, right? Yeah. Um, it starts with reading it off the It starts with reading it off the screen, right? This is my, basically for my benefit. If you have any questions, you can certainly ask them later. So a water right is a legal authorization to the beneficial use of water. It's got to be used for a beneficial purpose, for a reasonable quantity of public water during a certain time period and that it occurs at a certain place. Notice what this is means. This is not an unlimited right. First of all, it's an acquired right. It's not an inherent right in Washington state. So, and that goes against our in intuition because we say, hey, we need water. We need it to, to drink. We need it to thrive. It's an inherent right. But when it comes to acquiring water for individual purposes, it's an acquired right. It's not an inherent right, and it's a limited one. I've had plenty of, op uh, uh, of examples where somebody comes to me and says, I got a water right. And I said, yep, I see it. You got a water right. And they say, I can use, it, uh, use this water for whatever purpose and whatever amount. It's like, no, it doesn't work that way. I'll show you how this does work. Okay, so a water right is not an unlimited right. Hey, I'm one step ahead of myself. Okay, a water right is going to have uh, limitations put on it in terms of uh, the amounts you can use. So a water right is going to have an instantaneous quantity. That's a flow rate. So if you're pumping water from a well, it'll be listed in gallons per minute. Let's say it's for a domestic purpose. It would probably be for about 10 to 15 gallons per minute. It's also going to have an annual volume, or QA, um, that's what we see right down here. Um, an annual volume is measured in acre feet per year. And so that's going to limit the amount of uh, water you can pump during that entire year. It's that volume. Okay. It's also going to list on it a point of diversion or withdrawal. It's going to tell you where you can pump from. It's going to refer to a specific well or specific diversion on a river or stream. It's going to list a, a, uh, a purpose of use or series of purpose of use. Um, so a water right might be, if it's for a farm, might be for irrigation, stock watering, and domestic use. It's going to list a place of use, okay? If it is for a farm, let's say it's an 80-acre farm, it's going to outline where that uh, 80 acres are. It's going to have that all-important priority date, which tells you where you stand in that hierarchy of water rights. And then it's going to have a period of use. If it's for domestic use, it's going to be year-round. If it's for irrigation, it's going to be for the irrigation season, which uh, the dates have da varied over uh, the 80 or so years we've been um, uh, administering water rights. But basically, nowadays, it's mid-May uh, to uh, mid-October. So those are the things you're going to see on a water right document. OK. But we also have various different types of water rights, OK? We have water right certificates, okay? We have water right permits. We have water right claims. And then in this big circle, because it's a big, huge issue, we have in-stream flow water rights, okay? And I'm going to go through each and every one of these things. And by the way, guys, I know that I'm covering a lot tonight. There's not going to be a blue book test after this. Um, one of the big uh, takeaways here is I don't expect you to absorb all this. Um, I'm going to have some contact information at the end of this. Uh, the key thing here is get you an idea of how this regulatory environment works. And then if you have questions later on, you can contact Department of Ecology, and we'll answer your questions as best we can. So a water rights certificate is issued by the Department of Ecology when somebody's gone through all the steps to acquire a water right. And once they get that water right, 
as long as they use it, it's good in perpetuity. Think about that in a world of increasing competition and scarcity of water. That's valuable, very valuable. But as I'm going to mention uh, later on, you've got to use it, okay? You've got to continue to use that water. Um, so that's the final step after you've gone through the whole per permitting process. We have water right permits, okay? We issue a permit after we go through a fact-finding uh, effort. Uh, we have a four-step criteria, and we issue that permit. But it's not the final step. It's an interim step, and it allows you to build up uh, the infrastructure, to, say, to drill that well, build that diversionary works from that lake or stream, and put that water to beneficial use. And during that time, we're going to have you meter that use to get an idea of how much you need. Oftentimes, we will issue uh, the permit for amounts uh, that may be in excess of what you need. We want to, during that metering time period, to capture a high year, water year and a low water year. And then uh, the final process, when we get to that certificate, is we will look at that metering and say, this is the amount of water that you need. We cannot issue a water uh, right for the amount of water you necessarily want. Remember, water is owned in common. That means you can't speculate with it. Because if somebody's speculating with, with water, that means that somebody else who has an equal right to it may not get it. I'll give you an example. Somebody uh, has claimed all the water in the Pilchuck River. Um, I don't think they actually intend to use it. Um, but if we were to honor that claim, then nobody else could use water out of that, uh, the Pilchuck River from the date of that claim. OK, we also have water right claims. Oops, I'm going to learn how to do this one of these days. We have, we'll have water right claims. I'm going to go more and more into details with that. If you ever get into looking at water rights because you're a realtor, uh, maybe you're a developer or something like that, you will see claims. Um, and if, they're, if you're like me, you start making your hair turn gray. Um, and then we have in-stream flow water rights. And by the way, I need to ask, um, are we set up for the video in terms of sound? Okay. All right. I'll just I'll just talk through it. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so I've already discussed what a permit is. Uh, it's an undeveloped or not fully perfected or used water right. There's inchoate or unused amounts of water. Uh, so it's kind of incomplete. It's that midway step to f getting that final water right certificate. Um, a certificate, the one that you really want, that's perfected. It's fully developed. You've put that water to its best. Put that water to its best. Put that water to its best. And again, it's good in perpetuity. Um, let's see here. Uh, oops, did we go back? Okay. Yeah. Um, so this is for the folks out there who may be uh, real estate uh, developers, uh, uh, that sort of stuff. This actually shows what a water right looks like on a map. Um, it has a place of use. This was originally a parcel uh, developed back in 1950. And then it has uh, this little dot here, which is where they're diverting water. You can't really see it on this uh, screen, but there's a stream going through here. Now, this was developed in 1950. Let's see, advance. Come on. Hmm. Can you advance that for me? Okay, this is what it looks like today. So sometime in the past, somebody subdivided this. What is now, was once one parcel is now nine parcels. So who owns, who owns the water right? I don't know, nobody knows. So this is actually very common. So if you happen to be in the industry where you're looking at water rights, or somebody says, hey, I've got a water right, or you do research on a piece of property that you're interested in buying, and the person says, hey, I got a water right, this is very common. And if you simply take that at face value, you could be running into trouble, OK? So if you do come across uh, a property that has a water right, I strongly strongly urge you to contact Department of Ecology, and we will give you the rundown on this, because this sort of situation is very, very common. Very, very common. What usually happens is somebody acquires a water right, and they throw it into um, a file cabinet and forget about it for decades. And then something happens like a subdivision or something like that, and what the value of that water right might not be what you think it is. OK, so I've talked a little bit about claims. What are a claim? OK, so. Uh, the long story is, is back in the 19, late 1960s, 
California wanted to divert the Columbia River south to meet California's needs. Hmm, does this sound familiar? Hmm. Well, and, and who knows, they're probably going to try it again. You know, William Shatner made a few mentions about uh, diverting the Columbia River south. Um, Captain, that's completely illogical. Anyway, so we had this ongoing uh, competition for water back then, and it went all the way to Congress in Washington, D.C. And one of the arguments they were making in defense of this idea of diverting the Columbia River south was they were saying, look, Washington, you don't even know how much water you need. You've got all these people who uh, were using water prior to 1917 for surface water, prior to 1945 for groundwater, and you have no record of them. So what we did in response to that, we said, okay, we recognize that. We're going to open up a claims registry. For all those of you who think that you were, who, uh, we're using water prior to those two dates, prior to 1917 for surface water, prior to 1945 for groundwater, in other words, prior to those water codes, you can submit a claim and uh, we will uh, essentially adjudicate, again, a term of art, we will go through a court order process to determine the validity of those claims. So we got 229,000 claims. They were coming in by the mailbag full. I've heard nightmares about this. It took us five years to simply state stamp all these. Uh, it, was, it was a bit of a nightmare. It was a bit of a nightmare. I'm glad I was, I was still in diapers at that time. So we had these claims, and like I said, it was uh, the intention of the, of the legislature to set up an adjudication, determine whether these claims were valid or not. And we are doing that slowly in certain parts of Washington State, primarily in eastern and central, where there's far less water available than here. But in the western parts of the state, we have not gone through that adjudication process, so we don't know whether those claims are valid or not, legally valid. So if you see a document that says water rate claim on it, it may be valid, it may not be valid, okay? Contact Department of Ecology. We will do our best to, to try and answer that. Can't make any guarantees. Um, so these were initially filed under the 1967 Water Right Claims Registration Act, blah, 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 blah. Okay. So I've basically hit on the real importance of a water right claim. It may not be valid. Okay. Um, I mentioned the fact that at some point we hope to adjudicate these. Um, so let's move on to that last part, last type of water right. And I originally had a, um, a video presentation, really good video presentation. Turns out we don't have a uh, setup uh, for doing that. So I will just uh, talk a little bit about it. Um, fortunately, I have a follow-up slide on this. Remember, this is for my sake. You know, remember how I, I got to cue myself in on this. These water rights are water rights for a watershed. They're meant to protect what we call in-stream resources. In other words, ecosystems, aquatic ecosystems, wildlife, water quality, recreation. That's actually a really important one. So it's there to prevent over-allocation of water. The thing about our water code is, remember, it's over a century old, those ideas that, that created it. We didn't recognize that water was unlimited. Well, by the 1970s, yeah, we recognized that we had to protect our rivers and streams from overallocation because groundwater and surface water are one and the same. There is no difference. When you look at the groundwater elevation, it's the same as the elevation of the adjacent stream. So when you sink a well into the ground and start pumping on it, it's drawing water from any nearby water sources, okay? And so it's meant to protect the aquatic and wildlife habitat, as I've said. And we set this uh, by a rule by Department of Ecology after we do a scientific study. And the other important thing we do is we also engage in a lot of stakeholder um, uh, uh, negotiations on this. These are very, very controversial, okay? Remember the prior appropriation rule? These are water rights for the river, so once we set an uh, in-stream flow water right, we're saying, okay, during certain times of the year, if this river drops below certain minimum levels, any water right that comes after that is junior to it and therefore is subject to be interrupted. Okay, let me give you an example. The most controversial in-stream flow right we have in the state at this point is the Skagit in-stream flow rule, my research area unfortunately. Um, there is a reason why I'm going, going gray. Um, we set that rule on April 14, 2001, and we said, okay, we're going to say during certain times of the year, these are the minimum flows. So for instance, um, 
Steelhead uh, spawning season, April through June. We're going to set those flow levels uh, at about 12,000 CFS. Remember, cubic feet per second is one, about 450 gallons per minute. Um, and this is basically set a little bit higher to provide uh, uh, the resource, the, uh, the steelhead fish, uh, enough flows for them to spawn. And it also is meant to reflect those higher flows that occur due to snow melt, okay? But that was set in 2001. Let's say you acquire a water right in 2005, and you're junior to that in-stream flow rule, so potentially you can be subject to the interruption of your water when those flow, if those flows do not meet that minimum level. This is a very, very controversial subject because it has the potential of being very, uh, very disruptive uh, to people's water uses. And this is a huge issue because the tr in, up in the Skagit, the tribes have gotten involved in this. The tribes are saying, hey, listen, we are already seeing decreasing populations of critical fish like uh, Chinook, like steelhead, and they feel that this is a tool uh, that is absolutely, uh, this is something that requires absolute um, rigorous enforcement, um, whereas in other regions, it's more used as a water management tool. So there's some really serious controversies going on over the instrument for water rights. So um, it's equal to all other water rights. Not one water right is, is more senior to the other. Um, Okay, so let's talk a little bit about, about obtaining a new water right, okay? So, um, we basic, when we receive an application, uh, we are required to process them in the order in which we receive them. Um, that's based on sub-basin, so it wouldn't make a lot of sense um, if a water right application came in in eastern Washington and we, people over in western Washington had to wait until that one got processed. So we base it on the watershed. Um, but we uh, go through a four-step process to determine whether uh, we can approve that water right application. First of all, the water use has to be for beneficial, a beneficial purpose. So irrigation, really good one. Yeah, definitely. Domestic use. But if you want to put in that million gallon water, uh, um, uh, water fountain um, during, in a period where during high evaporation, that may not be really beneficial. Um, it's got to be, water's got to be legally and physically available, okay? If you're asking to draw water from a well and you want 100 gallons a minute, but that well only produces 30 gallons a minute, we're going to give you a water right for 30 gallons a minute, not for that 100. It's got to be physically available. It's got to be legally available. If you have an in-stream flow water right for that entire basin and you want to use it, uh, that water during times when those minimum flows are not being met, that water may not be legally available. It can't be uh, detrimental to the public interest, okay? Generally, those questions revolve around water quality. If you're going to cause an impact to the water quality, um, then we might rule uh, that it's not in the public interest and may not approve that water right. And then the water right can't ex impair existing, uh, other existing water rights. So if Fiona goes in and drills a well uh, right adjacent to mine and she starts pulling out 20,000 gallons per minute, and I'm just you know, <coughs> using my t uh, well for my little home, drawing 10 gallons a minute, and she sucks my well dry, I have the senior water right. She can't impair me. That's not true in every state. In Texas, um, basically, if you get the bigger pump, you win. Well, yes, well, hey, in Texas, everything's larger, right? Okay. So this is a water right process, so it's an open process. When you go, we go through this, you're required to publish um, in a local newspaper uh, that you're do, uh, trying to acquire this water right so that other people who have rights in that area regarding water uh, uh, can voice any sort of concerns they might have, and we have to take those into account. Okay, um, a water right can be lost, okay? I've attained a water right, I got, it goes back to 1955. It's for 100 gallons a minute, 10 acre feet per year, that's that annual volume. However, let's say I only use uh, it, I'm only using a fraction of that. In 1967, the legislature passed a law that says, if you have a water right and you are, do not use that water right or a portion of that water for five or more consecutive years, that portion uh, that you don't use is potentially relinquished back to the state. It's use it or lose it. 
this is a real heartache for some people. I've, I've been in a meeting where uh, one gentleman was very, very angry because he had to get a water right changed. He had to, um, uh, he was originally using surface water, uh, had to move to a groundwater well, so he had to go through the, uh, the process with Department of Ecology. We looked at his historical water use and we said, it's only a fraction of what he was uh, has written on his water right. So we said, we can only give you this fraction that you've been using. He's still very bitter about that after about 20 years. <laughs> so, but this goes back to the, why do we do this? It goes back to that idea that water's owned in common. You can't lock up water that you're not using. It's gotta be available uh, for, to maximize that, that beneficial use. A water right can also be abandoned. This is a little higher uh, level of, um, of non-use. When you tear out the well, when you tear out those diversionary works, where it's clear that you do not intend to divert water or use water again, that's called abandonment. Um, and we can simply say, hey, you've abandoned that uh, water use. Um, if this uh, comes up for any sort of uh, regulatory review, and we can simply say that water right doesn't exist anymore. Okay. Um, I'm just about finished up with my presentation. I just wanted to cover a few other challenges. I've already alluded to some of them. Um, tribal issues are a big one. They have federally reserved uh, treaty rights, and as they see uh, less, uh, decreases in fish populations, this is going to be an ongoing issue, okay? Um, that means that two-thirds of all our water law is actually not in statute, because remember those two gentlemen fighting over their, uh, their irrigation ditch? a large amount of our water law is actually de uh, created, or defined, rather. It's not uh, created, it's defined in court cases. Um, we have this kind of layer cake of law that uh, extends back about 120 years. It's a bit ramshackle. Uh, remember, the water, basic ideas behind the water code did not take into account the idea that uh, water is a limited resource. And so we're facing that issue that we're dealing with some really obsolete law in certain cases. One of the other ideas is keep in mind that all uh, needs or all uses are equal. There's no pri super priority for, say, domestic use. It doesn't, there's no uh, law that says, well, I've got a domestic use, so I've got a greater need. This is, in, is interpreted as a greater need than, say, for irrigation or for environmental purposes. And then what makes it even more difficult is this water law is not necessarily recognized by other law uh, that has impacts upon our environment. The Growth Management Act, the Endangered Species Act. And so sometimes it exists out in its own little world and it can catch you, really catch you up. It can really surprise uh, water managers and that sort of stuff um, by putting brakes on something that actually looks um, like it's in, um, um, uh, uh, compliance with other laws. Okay, um, again, some fu uh, future complications on this. Already talked about uh, tribal rights. Um, as you probably noticed in this entire presentation, there's some sharp edges to water law. Um, and we are going to be increasingly running into more and more conflict because of those sharp edges. Um, and there's an increasing lack of flexibility in water law. We, as water law, as water has become more and more contentious, uh, we've had to become more and more inventive in trying to create solutions to people. Unfortunately, uh, as a court case um, that got decided just last week pointed out to us, whenever we get inventive, we get slapped by the Supreme, Washington State Supreme Court and they say no. So uh, we're continually facing the issue of increasing f uh, inflexibility uh, when trying to balance those needs between people and the environment. So I think that we're going to be seeing some real changes in water law uh, because of the fact that we don't, uh, we're increasingly facing problems with meeting people's needs and the environment. Okay, um, yeah, I think that's about it. Uh, to, so to recap, what are the ideas I would like you as the audience to take away from this presentation? Because I've covered a lot and I don't expect, like I said, you guys to know everything. So, like I said, talked about increasing competition. I made that uh, abundantly clear. Um, water uses need a water right if you're going to be diverting surface water, okay? So if somebody's diverting surface water, if you're interested in purchasing a property and they're diverting surface water, ask for the water right. 
If they don't have one, contact the Department of Ecology. Doesn't mean they necessarily don't have one. They may just not have the record of it. But find out because that's uh, incredibly important to the value of that land. Um, water. Uh, um, for, you also need a water right if you're going to be diverting groundwater or using groundwater, except for those uh, certain exemptions. Uh, a water right is a limited right. It's not an unlimited right. So you've got to look at the water right itself and look at its provisions. And then uh, one last thing is if you do come across a water right, it may not be what you think it is on the face of it. Uh, there might be a subdivision, uh, which means that uh, that water right may not be pertinent or attached to that land. Um, there may be an issue about an abandonment or relinquishment. Contact Department of Ecology. Okay. Um, so, if you want to know about water rights, where can you find resources? We have our Water Resources Explorer website. Um, we are in the process of mapping water rights across the state. It's a very slow process. This is where I got my start at Ecology. Uh, I can tell you uh, that mapping a water right can any take anywhere between five minutes to three hours, depending on the complexity of its legal descriptions. Um, but we do have that information out there. Um, this is uh, shows an example. And you can actually bring up scanned copies of those original water rights. Um, we also have water availability focus sheets. This gives people an a idea of uh, whether water is available in our various sub-basins and what potential challenges and opportunities you have. And you can just Google that, water, uh, availability, water availability focus sheets, and you'll be able to find those. Okay. Questions. <laughs> it's been a long talk. Mm. Excuse me, I just need to take some water. Uh, you had your hand up first, I believe. Uh, clarification of use. Uh, you've indicated in some situations if you've got the water rights, it would be between a certain date, or if you've got it uh, a certain quantity. Mm -hmm. But if you um, if you want to use it sporadically during the year, maybe for irrigation, maybe for some other reason in November, mm -hmm. um, does the, the definition of use for come along with your water right if you get it in paper? Yeah, so basically we see it listed on a water right. And I didn't bring a copy of a water right. Most of our water rights are scanned old documents, so trying to see them on the screen is really a pain in the um, but you'll usually say on it for domestic, all, round, all year round use for domestic purposes. That's, a, that's a, uh, a, the type of print you'll see it. Or for irrigation between the uh, period of, say, May 15th to October 15th. That's the idea of what you'll see on there. And your drought, you may be wanting to irrigate mm -hmm. at some other time of year other than those given months. Yeah. What, uh, in that things? sort of situation, what you need to do is contact Ecology and say, I want to irrigate outside of that period that uh, was originally signed on the water right, and we will go through a change uh, process. We can, uh, like I said, we can change water rights. We can change just about anything on a water right except for increasing the quantities, okay? Um, there are some challenges. I got to be cautious about this. Um, the, there's no guarantee, I will not guarantee that we can approve a change application, okay, because each one is really unique, okay, but uh, the thing to do is to go through that change application process. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Okay, and you had a question over here, sir. Yeah, uh, King County had a survey in the late or mid-80s, uh, a part of their mineral resource inventory, and uh, we were given a uh, you know, uh, paper where we were supposed to fill up uh, where, what wells we had on our place. And, mm -hmm. uh, that and there, was, there was three wells uh, that drilled at different times. Uh, and uh, that paper kind of got set aside and lost. We didn't get it in. Mm -hmm. uh, does that have any bearing on Probably not, and that was probably a county um, endeavor to identify wells, uh, may have been for uh, other than water resource purposes, it might have been for water quality purposes. Counties are trying to, uh, in, in many cases, trying to locate wells uh, for water quality issues. 
Um, we have something called the Wellhead Protection uh, Program, where we look at where uh, contaminants that might be introduced into the ground, where they'll migrate to, and when they'll migrate to. And so that might have been part of the purpose. When it comes to water rights, uh, the counties don't have any real authority. It's Department of Ecology that does. So um, if you don't have a water right, if you don't have a water right claim, my guess is those were probably what the, are called those permit exempt wells. And one of those was condemned to put in the roundabout uh, for highway, mm -hmm. and we were given like 20 cents on the dollar for what it would take to replace it. But we didn't do it right away. Does that make a difference? We still need to get that well in place. Are you saying that there, is there still a water right associated with that? I'm not sure exactly what your yes. question is. Yes. Um, so if the well was taken out, um, essentially uh, that water right uh, goes away. But your a person is still entitled, entitled to drill a permit exempt well and use those quantities. So if you have, say, three wells on the property, it sounds to me, I mean, understand that each case is unique, and I'm not looking at the particulars of your property. So take what I say with a certain grain of salt, but I would say that uh, those uh, group of wells that you have uh, are each entitled, uh, excuse me, are entitled to those permit exempt quantities. Now, that's not knowing whether you have a water right. You, there could be a water right on record for larger quantities. And if you want to know more about this, um, uh, feel free to contact us. In fact, Come on. Next. There we go. Contacts. So um, feel free to contact us. Um, I'll see if I brought some business cards. Do you have I, a handout for that? Pardon? Do you have a handout for those? No, I sure don't. I can always um, get, you know, we can send this PowerPoint through if you guys want that. Oh. Yeah. 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 Sure. Okay. We can get yep. that. Um, we, like I said, we strongly encourage you to contact us. Um, we will tell you what we know uh, about records for water uh, on any particular property. Yes? We've got two questions from online. Okay, great. Uh, the first one is, water rights in Washington, uh, how do you define what a project is? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a, there's a smart person. If you could say that again so that they can hear you through the computer. Uh, Certainly. Um, so. In regards to water rights and that uh, issue I mentioned earlier, what defines a project in regards to permit exempt wells? Because remember, a permit exempt, the permit exempt quantities apply to one project. That's a good question and we kind of had to scratch our heads about this and um, it also was um, partially resolved in the Supreme Court case called Campbell and Gwynn. Um, basically, if there's how this all came about was there was an argument about a development and uh, whether they had exceeded those 5,000 gallons per day because uh, the total amount of wells that were go going to be put in place would exceed that 5,000 gallons. And what it was defined as is if there's any sort of relationship, familial relationship, uh, economic relationship that points it back to one single intent or one single project, then it's one project. Okay, I can't really give uh, the audience a better uh, description than that. Uh, we have to sometimes look at these as a case by case, but I'll give you an example and maybe this will make it a little clearer. Let's say you're a developer and you say, okay, I'm going to uh, take this 40 acre parcel and I'm going to subdivide it and I'm going to give half of it to my brother. And I'm going to develop the first half um, and put on uh, 20 uh, wells. And then six months later, or six years later, my brother comes along and uh, he also uh, puts on 20 uh, one, uh, lots and 20 wells. And the total of that is going to exceed those 5,000 gallons uh, per day for domestic use. That's one project. There's a, there's a, a, a familial or family relationship there. And there's a, clearly there was an intent there that it would have been one project. Because normally what would happen is, is somebody would have just developed that whole 40 acres. If there's any uh, reason to think that somebody's trying to get around uh, that permit exemption limitation, yeah, that's, that's a bit of an issue. It's, again, one, one of those things where we look at it as a case-by-case -case basis. And there was a second question? second question was, what is stock watering? <laughs> <laughs> I got a smart audience tonight. 
Good question. Um, we actually had to go to the Attorney General's office to ask uh, what was stock watering, and they consulted Webster's Dictionary. <laughs> it's, it's basically uh, things like ha uh, cattle, horses, uh, chicken, this sort of stuff. It's, I can tell you what it's not. It's not dog rearing. It's not fish. Um, and we have a whole list of things that says what it is and what it isn't. It's been a while since I've gone over the Attorney General's opinion on this. Um, so uh, what I think the bit, um, sort of the nutshell is it's your traditional uh, stock watering. It's not something like mink for mink coats. Um, so if you have a question about that, contact Department of Ecology. We'll dust off that Attorney General's opinion and give, a, uh, give you what we know. Question over here. So oh yes. Rain barrels, ditches and swales, ponds. Excellent question. I'm glad you brought that up. Um, I actually wanted to put that in my presentation, but Fiona holds me to a very uh, tight standard of time. So up until... Of which you're coming up to. Okay. <laughs> she keeps me on the straight and narrow. So up until recently, and this was a weird thing about Washington water law, Surface water included water above the earth. Now, how that actually slipped into the law, I don't know. Um, but it basically, it required a water right to use rainwater. It doesn't make a, lot, a whole lot of sense. Um, a few years ago, uh, one of our outgoing directors uh, wrote a policy statement that says, rainwater, uh, we don't believe that rainwater requires a water right. And we strongly encourage rainwater collection uh, we're uh, in certain areas where we're having these really intense arguments over water between tribes, between water conservationists, between landowners like the Skagit. We're trying to encourage it for potable water purposes. Um, but this is something we uh, believe creates a beneficial use uh, for uh, uh, people and doesn't have uh, an appreciable impact on uh, any sort of watershed or its uh, ecosystem. So we strongly encourage that. Yes, question over here. Yes. Uh, how are springs viewed? Spring is surface water. Okay. And what would you need to obtain the rights for your spring? You need to uh, submit an application to the Department of Ecology, and we go through that four-part test that I outlined, determining whether it's beneficial use, whether water is legally and physically available, uh, whether there would be impairment of other or water rights, that sort of stuff. I will mention to you that uh, getting a surface water right is harder these days than getting a groundwater right in general. But we can look at that. Um, we encourage people who are uh, looking to get uh, a new water right. We have uh, the opportunity now to give you guys what we call a pre-consultation uh, meeting, where we sit down with you after you've p filled out a form, and we can tell you what are the options and what are the opportunities and the likelihood of you getting a water right before you file that uh, water right application and pay your 50 bucks. They can, but they have to do that by going through a change application with us. That's a very good question because many people think that they can just take that water right with them or they can transfer it by uh, a warranty deed or some other uh, real estate document. And the answer is, is no, you can't do that. I'm dealing with a uh, uh, issue up uh, exactly like that up in the still Guamish right now. Uh, decades ago, somebody thought they could do that, and somebody was given the false impression that they actually had a water right. So <coughs> what you have to do is, you, uh, if you're going to move that water right, you have to go through the Department of Ecology and get an approval to do that. It, it, Where, whereas, if you buy a property and you want to have, you want to purchase not only the, wa the property but also the water right of that property. So the water right is a pertinent or attached to that land. Okay. Yes. Okay. So we're running out of questions, but it sounds like we've got some more. So um, Fiona asked me earlier, "Hey, will you stay by, stand by, in case uh, people have other questions?" And yeah, I'll stay here until um, after uh, this is all over. Do you want to finish just that one, ladies? Okay, yeah, go ahead. You did say groundwater and surface water are the same. Correct. Well, does it, isn't that a product of rainwater? 
Uh, I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Isn't, aren't groundwater and surface water products of rainwater? Yes, absolutely. So if you're collecting rainwater, you're collecting something that could be diverted away from the ground. Yeah, it, exactly. It is part of the hydro, what we call the hydrogeologic uh, or hydrologic cycle. You're going to go through that I'm later on. It's one of those interesting conundrums, right. but right. only if I mean started putting massive amounts of roofing space yeah. right. and collecting it for, yeah. for profit, so then it's no, no then it's not okay. So here's the thing about the uh, rainwater catchment policy that we have. First of all, it can only be done on a pre-existing structure that has a different purpose. Uh, other than rainwater catchment. So you can't just build a uh, rainwater catchment uh, structure um, and use it solely for that purpose unless it's for uh, what we call a, um, a stock watering guzzler. In other words, it's meant to uh, provide water to, uh, for stock watering purposes. But you've got to do it off a pre-existing structure. It's got to be off a home or something like that. I know because I was dealing with uh, Snohomish County and they said, oh, we've got a gravel pit operation. We're going to build this huge rainwater collection system. And it's like, are there any pre-existing buildings? Uh, no. It's like, sorry. <laughs> so the thing is, to answer your question is, it is part of the hydrogeologic uh, cycle, but for most purposes, the rooftop of your home is so small in comparison to the overall basin and the amount of recharge through precipitation that comes down that that impact is seen as being uh, minimal. Well, like you're grabbing it from the road and from other impervious surfaces. Um, well, then you got a serious water quality problem. Uh, <laughs> let's put it this way. The, the chemicals and particulates that are coming off uh, that road, ooh, really grim. Um, I, I, I would strongly urge you not to do that. So just to let you know, I'm also part of the uh, college's uh, hazmat response team. And so I deal with the chemical issues <laughs> as well. So the roof is one thing. The roof is one thing. From the road, you cannot do that. That, that, is, that is considered a surface water diversion and needs a water right. So if someone's diverting the water off the road. I've never heard of that before. I've never heard of somebody. Are you talking for possible water use? Or just for buying soil? No, because for rainwater, you can use it for non potable yeah. purposes. Many people use it for gray water purposes. They use it for flushing toilets or uh, using it for what? Yes. Yes. That's my bit. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Okay. That's a new one. <laughs> I'm, 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 I've been at a college. This goes back to the very f first part of my uh, presentation where I said that after 35 years, my boss had to come to the conclusion there were no experts in water law. That we can run across new things all the time. I've actually never heard of that before. Um, this, but you know, at the same time, especially in suburban and, and really built up areas, people are getting inventive about how to conserve water. Um, I wouldn't necessarily say that that's uh, something that ecology would frown upon. Um, because what you're trying to do is you're trying to, you're actually reducing stormwater runoff, um, which is a very serious concern. It's our biggest water quality concern in the entire state. Um, because all that water gets flushed down into our sewer systems, many of which go right into our rivers. Um, the particulates, the chemicals, the heavy metals that come off your brakes, all those have a very serious uh, cumulative impact on our streams and rivers. And as an example, you've all, we've all seen that asphalt sealant Washington state is the first state to ban uh, tar-based uh, asphalt sealants. And the reason being is these are incredibly toxic uh, to aquatic life, uh, to fish, and they accumulate in the uh, underside of gravel beds where uh, we typically see salmonid species spawning. So uh, we've moved towards that. So uh, that's a real improvement. But you notice those asphalt sealants, they start to abrade, they start to wear away very shortly after they're uh, put down, after they're applied. And so it's still not healthy for our streams and rivers, even though they're not tar-based. Okay, I think I'm out of time. <laughs>
right. Thank you, John. Are you going to stay around until the end? Yeah, there's a lot of questions, so I'll stay around until the end. Wonderful. Yeah, you can buy me a beer. <laughs> <laughs> buy myself a beer, too. So, actually, this was actually a great segue um, when John was talking about the um, pollutants coming off of our hard services. Because what we're going to look at now is a sort of very quick um, look at the water cycle, the hydrologic cycle, and how our built environment affects that. And then we're going to look very particularly at the Puget Sound and how that sort of urbanization and what that is actually doing to and impacting the water cycle. So here we have um, the water cycle, and, and just like a bicycle, where does, the, where, does the, where does it start? Well, water's been cycling through this system, um, through this natural system for millennia. Um, I mean, evaporation going up and then moving down into precipitation, and then finally we go into um, infiltration, which is where we it's meant to just start percolating through, coming into groundwater, eventually seeping into our aquifers, and then recharging back. So it's this very intimate and connected cycle. And the problem, I should have brought my, this is better. The problem is everything is connected. And that's the beautiful thing is the web of life, everything is connected. But the problem is when we start to introduce pollutants and we start impacting the soil surface. So watersheds, and this is where when somebody says, I own my water, where did it come from? Because watersheds, we have in the United States um, about 22,110 watersheds. Do they have any boundaries? No, they know no boundaries. And as you understand, it's all, it's water flowing into a, a sort of common area, lake, pond, river. So in its ideal world, we wouldn't have, um, and this is your, like just your concern, which is that, you know, water, somebody's capturing the water above you. That's why they always say, you know, be careful what you do because it's going downstream. Um, I, I don't know, I, I think I just came in into uh, this planet this time just already hardwired for it. You can't do that to nature. Don't, don't spread all of those pesticides because it's getting into our water. It's just every time we're doing this, in fact, we have this great demonstration uh, for our larger classes uh, where we have an, something called an Enviroscape model. I encourage you all to see it if you can get to, to see that one day. We, we literally just sort of demonstrate you've got You've got industrial uses, we've got roadways, we've got built environments. And you start to see things like even dog poop, your fertilizer that seems so innocent on your own little space, suddenly we're how it's ending up into our waterways and why we have such a chronic problem with the Puget Sound as far as cleanup. So in understanding groundwater and um, what we understand that in our infiltration phase, that what we're looking at is this recharging the water table. And as John said a little bit earlier, the problem was when the more we had all this rain happen, it wasn't recharging, um, wasn't going down any further. It was just being sucked up by the water table that was incredibly dry at that point. So, and this is, of course, what we're hearing now is happening. Um, we heard uh, stories of down in Eugene, people's wells were going dry. Um, we've got down in the San Joaquin, ya how do you pronounce it? Joaquin? Joaquin. Joaquin. I'm not around from around here. <laughs> San Joaquin Valley, where in the north end, now it's sunk 10 inches. The south end has sunk 13 inches because their approach to the drought was just drill more wells. Well, okay, people, what happens when we drill more wells? Where's that lovely little, ah, yes. So we start drilling and we drill deeper. And now what are we doing? We're now tapping into a confined aquifer. So the water is 
recharging through different geologic formations. And some of these can recharge in days and years. But guess what? When we start getting deeper, that recharge may take centuries. And if we go even deeper, that recharge may take thousands of years. And then we have a problem if we've at that point. And so you start hearing the issues of subsidence, sinkholes occurring, um, and, gen and in addition, when our ground, when our water table starts dropping, that's also, since it's part of the groundwater, it's actually then drawing away from the rivers. So the rivers have less opportunity to survive. I don't know about you, but that worries me deeply. So here we are, most of us the boomer generation. And what did we want to do? We hit the ground running in the 50s and didn't look back in development, developing roads, getting on our cars out there. And this is what basically the Puget Sound looks like from a development density perspective. Now, at a certain point, you start to go, oh, God, is there anything we can do about it? The beautiful thing is individual action collected together has an impact. And so we're going to talk about what are the individual actions that we can take. So this gives, again, just a, a I, lo I love visuals. Um, I think it's a great way to uh, identify and to, to grok the picture. So in a normal cycle, we have about 40% that actually of our sort of precipitation comes down and it's, um, we've got evapotranspiration. So that goes back up into the atmosphere. And then we have about 10% idelium runoff. And then after that, about 25% will go into recharging at the shallow level. And then 25% goes in deep. So that's our natural cycle. The problem is we keep on interfering with that natural cycle. And in the urban environment, this is then the story of precipitation. So what we now have is only 30% of evapotranspiration and 55% runoff. 55% runoff that's accumulating all of those fertilizers and chemical compounds and toxins and discharges from our cars. Mm -hmm. And then only 10 in shallow and five going into deep infiltration. Now we've just been on this crazy building for basically 80 years. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yes, 50, yeah. 75, 70, yeah. 75, 80 years, and we're not going away as a population unless we do something really stupid. We seem to be heading that way. So this then is the urban water cycle. Uh, this is why in Germany you can't do a development in the, in the city without putting in roofs, green roofs, for two reasons. One, slowing down the stormwater because they've got these lovely old cobble streets and it's too expensive to dig up those, and besides which, it allows the water to percolate and infiltrate back in. So there you have to put green roofs in if you want to do any development there. And that slows down the water and also keeps those cities cooler. So it, it's a mitigating of the urban heat effect. So just gonna give you one more visual on then what happens when we start the ground, uh, the water table starts dropping. So as you can see, again, we, we end up getting dry wells. We may have subsidence in dry wells and salt water intrusion. Sometimes even when we drill too deep, we get salt water intrusion and some of the, the highly uh, mineralized aspects. So those are the negative aspects. Now, um, this is also, I think you, you showed this, John. So here's the issue with Washington State. 
yes, we have normal rain patterns up to, we seem to have been having a normal rain pattern. The problem is we have a real issue with storage. So because the next thing is, um, <coughs> charts shows you, I promise I'm not going to kill you by charts. <laughs> it's the last of the charts. But this chart shows the issue. We have our precipitation and we've been relying on snow melt to provide our water at our highest consumption point, which is basically June, September. And we, we come sort of start coming back down in October. So we have a storage issue. And storage is going to be one of the things that we're going to talk about, collection and storage and how um, and yes, it is legal. So, I, I, I give a lot of classes and it still staggers me how much we as Americans consume. We are 4.5% of the world's population and we consume 25% of the world's resources, 40% of the world's oil. And I have to say, we have as an equally shocking record in water. So the average per capita um, for America is 146. And I actually just heard something from T Tacoma Power Utilities that the average per capita in, uh, that they serve is 167 gallons a day per capita. Now, if we break this down, I always like to say, um, England, 31. France is probably a lot less because you know they don't shower, mm -hmm. barely bath. <laughs> so that's my, that's my joke. I hope I have not offended any <laughs> French people in the room <laughs> or listening. <laughs> and we'll get some rude. <laughs> so this is the problem. So we're already, we're just, we're continuing on our over bloated consumption patterns. I think that's one way we can put it. So we have these consumption patterns. And of this 147, as an average per capita, 56% we spend on landscape, we use on landscape. Now that's a real problem in Washington State where, guess what? That's our lowest, that's, that's our zero point of precipitation. So again, what can we do about it? Now, I've said to you guys, I'm very happy to I'll supply the PDF of this so you can um, take it back to your families. One of the most important things, I believe, in building awareness is, is starting the conversation with your grandchildren, your children, your neighbors, your uh, friends. And this is a sort of a fun calculator you can do, with, particularly with younger children is to start getting them involved in the conversation, becoming aware of how they use water and why they use water. In other words, you know, it's not that we don't want the syndrome of just turning on the lights and moving out, rather like just turning on the tap. So starting this conversation, the other thing is you can then start to look at yourself in comparison to how do we compare? Maybe we start a neighborhood ch challenge. Who? Who can, be, who can reduce the water the most? We need to start bringing these conversations out into our communities. So, leaks. We're going to look at leaks because, and that's not the ones you, you uh, cook with. But I do feel sorry for the individual who had to count how many drips in that gallon. Do you not feel sorry for that person? Because, you know, you miss one drip and it's like, oh my God, I've got to start again. <laughs> Happily, you don't have to, to do that. Somebody else suffered for you. Um, but you, if you think you've got drips, here's another one also to, um, you can sort of then identify, you know, you can look at the number of drips um, over a minute and then you can calculate what your uh, waste of water and we'll see what waste of money is going to be. Personally, rather than do that, I would just fix the leak. Mm -hmm. 
So um, who's on, I know a couple of us are on wells, but who's on uh, water meters? Okay. So what we've got here is the um, leak test for residents. The first thing is, if you're feeling like you've got maybe unusually high water bills, then that might be a sort of a red flag to you to say, okay, I, want, I, I should check um, whether I've got a leak. Um, so basically what you're going to do, obviously, is make sure that you're do, um, checking the, the meter at a point when nobody's using the water in the house. So tell them either nobody's there or make sure everything's shut off. Then what you want to do is then look to see if your meter is running. If it's running, then obviously you have a leak um, inside. So then you're going to close off the, the main valve, careful about where, how opening up the, the cover because that can be a hazard for anybody on the street if it happens to be just near the street side. So, um, so you're going to shut that off and if it's still moving, then what you know is that um, you, you can then tell that it's probably on the outside. After that, shut, and then if it's still leaking, so shut, you'd shut off your irrigation, and if it's still leak, it's still, that dial is still moving, then you know it's between the meter and the valve, the shut off valve for the house. So again, um, what you want to do is just sort of go through the steps and um, if you don't know where your shut-off valve, it's a good time to learn. I did a renovation, house renovation, where um, we were doing everything. And I'm in the bathroom, start to turn off the faucets, and literally the faucets were so rusty that the mains water blasted me against the back of the... And we didn't know where the shut-off valve was. <laughs> it was a very expensive and day. <laughs> um, so leak test, again, very simple um, thing. You can usually hear it, you know, it maybe you might have to jiggle the flapper, but if the flapper, d if it's still leaking, then, um, I mean, clearly just put, what you want to put is food dye in the toilet bowl, and if it starts, I mean, in the in toilet, in the tank, and if it starts showing up in the toilet bowl, you know that you've got a leak, and it's pr usually the flapper. So it's a, a quick replace. We're also going to look at that, that if you're actually at that point where you've got leaks in your um, flappers, you may want to upgrade your toilet, and there's a, a really high efficiency products now, um, a very reasonable price. We have to actually thank Australia and Australian manufacturers for some of the most efficient water products um, on the market now because they've been dealing with severe drought for, I think, is that almost 10 years now. It, it is not a drought anymore. It's the new norm. They changed the definition. It's, a, it's just what they're dealing with. I hope we don't have to say that for ourselves. Um, so, like everything, when, we're, when, we, when we move towards whether it's energy efficiency or if we, move at, if we look at water conservation and water efficiency, the very first thing that we do is we deal with, we start at the conservation side, and that's usually a behavior change. So we're going to have a very quick, fun interaction, and um, feel free, the, the people on um, simulcast, if you want to type in some of the behavior changes you think that are appropriate, but we're going to sort of run through the three main areas um, in the house that use the most amount of water, three areas. So first of all, obviously bathrooms, and then our kitchen, and then laundries. Okay, so let's name a few great um, behavior changes that we can do in the bathroom. Anybody want to interject? Shall I start? So. If it's yellow, let it melt. I love it. If it's brown, flush it down. Yeah. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Absolutely. That's. We've got the. We've got the toilet. What else might you want to do? Besides. Um, shower instead of taking a bath. Shower instead of taking a bath. Now talking of showers. Guess what? 
low flow and um, just because we as consumers we don't like the idea of low flow it just gives us a really sort of poor feeling oh, I'm gonna have a poor experience under the shower low flow so they're actually called high efficiency <laughs> <laughs> it's all in marketing you know <laughs> so it's high efficiency uh, water scents uh, faucets and shower heads, absolutely. But one of the great behavior changes that we can actually do is who showers in, in this, I'm not asking all your bathing habits, but <laughs> basically, um, I, sh I shower rather than bath. Yeah. yeah, so I've already cut down and I give myself a bath maybe once every two weeks. <laughs> That's my luxury soak time. Um, but. But one of the things we can do is actually we can, shut, we, we can reduce the amount of time that we spend in the shower. So the average, um, average American, eight minutes in the shower to 2.2 to 2.5 gallons per minute. It's about 17 gallons that we're consuming. And so if you times up by the number of people in your house, you can start to see we use a lot of water. So even cutting back one minute is going to start saving cumulatively a lot of gallons um, if you're having that lovely bath and you can't knock a bath if you're going to have that bath and it happens to take a little bit of time to get that water hot water put a bucket gather that water and then you can water your plants um, what else might we not want to do John so um So, you know, wet your toothbrush, then touch your mouth, turn off the faucet, then brush your teeth, then turn the water back on when you're done to finish your business. And the same is true with shaving. Um, if, uh, I think a straight razor. <laughs> yeah, no, but many people run the uh, faucet continuously during these operations. And you don't need to. No, exactly. And it, it's, it's really interesting for me when I first started developing these classes. I, the very first thing I caught myself on was, oh, I kept the tap running on the toothbrush thing, and now it's like off, on, off, on. But it works. It really does. Um, yes. What about... Uh, I should... Mm -hmm. yeah, the same problem I did. Thank you. Now, what about kitchen? Any ideas? Run a full dishwasher. Run a full dishwasher. Ideally, run a full dishwasher that is an Energy Star dishwasher, because um, they use about, f you know, at full five and a half gallons. Anybody else? Interesting enough. Um, mostly not. If you've got a high efficiency, notice I said high efficiency Energy Star dishwasher. Um, and you're packing it full, um, it's going to use less water typically because if you're hand washing dishes, you usually end up, most of us, rather like the tea thing, the tap's running. Um, if you were to be very conscious, put it into a bowl and have another bowl where you so wash in this and then rinse in that, then that's probably more efficient than a dishwasher. Um, obviously, uh, anybody like cold water to drink? No, I don't either. <laughs> Ghastly. But for those who it really love it, then just rather than run your tap, just fill up a jug and put it in your refrigerator so that it's cool already. Um, so those are really... Another thing is don't wash off your plates. If you're loading your dishwasher, don't wash them off. Scrape them off. And again, it's one of those sort of duh, but they all, all of this adds up as far as gallons. And then uh, the laundry, the main one, wash with full loads, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and ideally, if you haven't got a um, front load dish, um, washing machine, they are much more water uh, conscious than the top loaders. There's a difference of about 15 to 20 gallons per 
wash. If your jeans don't stand up by themselves, they're not ready to wash. <laughs> <laughs> I thought when the jeans walked their way to the... <laughs> was when they actually needed a wash. <laughs> um, an interesting one, which is ideally not washing your car at home because of the particulates, so that actually when you, when you go to a laun not a laundromat, but you go for a car, car wash, then actually they're gathering um, all of that um, toxic, essentially toxic water. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's quick. Did we have any, um, anything come in from, no, they, they won't. Here's the biggie. We talked about storage is the issue, so yes, it makes absolute sense for us to do rainwater harvesting. And so what we're going to look at are some of the systems that you can use, depending, again, um, there are systems we can do for design. Uh, we're going to look also at some a water, con a water certification for a house as a, as a builder. What I know is when we get it right in design, we can really reduce the costs on energy, we can really reduce the amount of water we're using, and we can be much, much more resource efficient without any impact on quality of life. So if you're in the sort of um, either renovation stage or um, new construction time, this is the ideal time to plan and to, to fix out your, do your whole water budget. But these are examples of, you can bury systems. Um, these are some large, uh, like 500,000 gallon tanks. Um, these were some systems that were put into actually a project, townhome project here in Seattle, or in um, Issaquah, uh, Z Homes. Have you guys been to Z Home? Should, you should go check it out. Uh, really amazing. They achieved a 71% reduction in water usage through their strategies. So I really want to stress, Seattle is, you guys are in a really burgeoning area for um, rebates and incentives on water systems um, and also for rain gardens. So we're gonna look at these two issues. We have too much rain sometimes and major stormwater events that are um, flooding our sewer systems and creating a lot of pollution runoff. So we want to deal with that. How do we capture that water and use it and be able to recharge? And then how can we capture water so that it can, we can use it for storage, whether that is for emergencies, whether it's for irrigation in the summer, or whether it's actually for then potable water, um, or if it's for potable, uh, for water that's going to say um, use for laundry and flushing our toilets. When you think about that little wee dot of fresh water, and we're using precious fresh water to flush our number ones and twos, it's almost, it's almost asinine. That to me is where we should be having a, an immediate plumbing code. Um, change. So if you're going to go into the, um, the route of wanting to choose, um, wanting to, to collect rainwater for potable water, there's some really important parts in rainwater. You can collect off a uh, asphalt um, shingled roof. Um, interesting enough, Department of Ecology has actually done some to toxic tests on different roofing types, and it was a surprise, but asphalt shingles were not any more, they're actually the most toxic was a cedar shingle that had been treated, interesting enough. So what you have is um, basically you want to work with somebody who's um, an accredited professional, ideally American Rainwater Catchment System, um, because what you're going to do is you'll calculate the total roof area you've got. You're going to look at how much um, of that you're going to need to divert at one point. In other words, you wouldn't want just one downspout coming off a 1,500 square foot roof, for instance, because you would flood, your, flood that system, overwhelm it. So you want to uh, spread them out. You have 
a, you know, a catchment area to make sure all the debris is not getting into there. And then this is what's called the first flush. So it diverts off the first amount. And then you can go into your storage tank, whatever the size it is of that storage tank. That then may lead into um, your water tank for the house and you would want at least, they recommend three levels of um, filtration if you're using this for um, water, drinking water. One of those levels obviously being um, UV. This is not an inexpensive investment. So I think we start first of all with storage possibly for um, <coughs> water as far as flushing, laundry, and irrigation. Thank you. I, I probably I probably did a, a hex on this thing because I looked at that and I went, oh God, that one. I always go wrong on me. <laughs> <laughs> Hence, I've got a different one that I didn't bring. So here are some examples um, of rainwater collection for irrigation. You can see they've set up uh, this one, which is actually at a school where they're collecting the rainwater and then they're using through drip, drip irrigation, the most uh, efficient way. Um, this is a project that Martha Rose, if you've no, have you seen any of Martha Rose's work? She's a really progressive builder, um, just doing some beautiful things. She's doing uh, green roofs. She's uh, got a very energy efficient home, very conscious about her materials and also collecting water. So she's here, she's She's got actually a small sedum roof here, so it's, it's uh, gathering, um, taking the first load you know, of the, the heavy rain, and then it filters into this system, and then that actually is for small little um, urban gardens. So a nice idea. Uh, again, your most, probably your cheapest version is putting at least five rain barrels together. One rain barrel is not a rainwater collection system. It's a place that's going to be overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so what you want to do is you'll, you'll link them up together. Um, and they think they're, they're doing, they've got more and more folks who are now providing these services. Uh, but pretty simple. Most important is obviously having an overflow. Because once it's filled up, now here's a much more sophisticated um, rainwater collection system. Uh, as you can see, it's coming from all the different downspouts here and it's got a cleaning and then this is all um, going out to, uh, out to irrigation. So I said it was all about design, remember? So with uh, landscape design, we obviously are going to use native plants. Why? Because they're already used to our extremely wet cycle and our very dry cycle, or at least most of them are. Um, so we want to use native plants. You, I'm talking to permac permaculture guys, so I don't really need to tell you too much more about um, xeriscaping, but for the folks who are um, saddle casting in, Xeriscaping essentially is designing a landscape for where you have no additional irrigation needs. Did I get it right? Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> and one of the most important things, again, I love my background of construction because what I, what I learned through that is just how powerfully we impact the soil the moment we build. So, you know, we can do nothing but destroy the soil, mi the microorganisms, um, the permeability, the friability, everything, because we bring those heavy equipment in, we pound and we pound, and then what do we see with so many subdivisions? The final stage is, let's back up the, the, uh, the truck, let's drop all that sort of sandy soil mixture, and then we're going to slap some turf down on it. And we're going to call it, and then we're going to stick in a um, sprinkler system, and we're going to call it done. And it's instant, beautiful America that 
those plants cannot survive, they will not thrive because they can't break through the hard pan. It's a simple thing in construction. Just break up the hard pan. Introduce compost. So again, we want to use um, soil amendments and what we can do is we can use various mixtures of those when we're looking at slowing down stormwater. So we're going to look at grain, um, rain gardens, bioswales, etc. We're also going to look at irrigation. Um, who's got a sprinkler system? So okay. Just make sure we're, you're, you're doing a thorough check of it annually because um, the ideal is for us to design so we don't need sprinkler systems or ideally replace it with a drip irrigation. But you've probably got an established yard by now. We uh, the the system, system came when we bought that yeah. That's right. Yeah. yeah. So um, using native plants, obviously. Uh, here's one resource. And again, I'm sure you've got some even better resources uh, as far as working with native plants. I've got a great book, because I'm also a pretty passionate gardener, called Right Plant, Right Place. And it's such a great analogy, because if, if we don't, whether it's a plant or us, if we're not thriving, it's because we're not in the right place. We're not in the right conditions for ourselves. So here's examples um, of, this is some native planting. This is xeriscaping. Um, again, I think sometimes the idea is, is that if we are controlling, that we, you know, we're, we're designing for, for not using extra water, that we're gonna somehow have a minimal experience when in fact uh, it can be absolutely the opposite. So this is, who understands the principle of rain gardens? Great. So the, uh, the idea of a rain garden is what we're doing is we're capturing, again, the, the whole strategy is we're in an urban environment where we've got these large stormwater events and they're overwhelming our sewer systems and they're carrying all of these pollutants into our waterways and eventually into the sound. So the idea is, could we create enough single diversion points that we could um, start to resolve this issue? And so rain gardens are that one of the solutions to doing that. And essentially what we're doing is we're digging a depression. Um, we're taking, again, the total roof area times our major stormwater event to identify the cubic volume of water we need to handle at any one time. Ideally, not in one space. We want to space it out. We could do a connection of, say, water from the roof into um, rain, you know, rain collection, and then the spillover going into the rain garden. So we, we're collecting and we're slowing down. These are the key components. We want to slow that water down so that it can infiltrate back into and restart recharging our groundwater. Um, and so what we do is we use native plants, and we're going to be doing uh, the types of, say, sedges, native sedges that can have their feet wet for weeks. And then we have plants on the side that can handle the drought areas, and they will also be able to handle drought as well. Now, if you don't know of this resource, this is a fabulous resource. Uh, this is the rainwise.com, um, and or oh, rainwiseseattle.gov, and they're giving up to they're, I, at the moment, I think people are getting a, right around 75% um, of the full cost of rain gardens and or cisterns. So avail yourself of this. This is one of the areas. I'm not certain if you're in Tacoma. What I would find out from your utility, uh, water utility, um, or the city council, is if there are any rebates. So you've got some great rebates in Seattle, unincorporated King County also. And again, you've got all this, but the um, rainwise at seattle.gov. 
and the Gardner Hotline 206 Okay. Obviously, you know, we, we can get much smarter. One of the things that I mean, it seems ever since I've, I did this class that all I see are sprinklers going off at the wrong moments. Um, it's raining and the sprinklers are going. It's not raining and the sprinklers are only sprinkling the road. And they're totally avoiding the, 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 the grass and stuff like that. But we can also start using much smarter, weather smart, rather like, you know, we're now starting to use smart thermometers that can sort of tell basically when you're getting up, the temperature you like, when you get back, and adjust everything. Well, we've got weather-based controllers as well. Here we are. <laughs> yes, and I've seen worse. So, where are we at? I understand it's late. 9.02. 9.02, my goodness, John. <laughs> That's my fault. So, I want, I'm going to go through water certifications quickly. You guys okay? If anybody has to leave, I understand. Um, but we'll, we'll get through this one. I want to talk about water sense because what it is, it's a, gr it's a water um, efficiency, essentially, uh, certification. It was developed by the Environmental Protection Agency really because a lot of the green building certification programs were a bit light, quite frankly, on water conservation and water efficiency strategies. So it can be, it's a new construction, um, also for multifamily, but you can use it for retrofits. So uh, for all of us who are not going straight into a buying out, going out and buying a new house or building a new house. It all starts in design, remember? So it's just the same with a WaterSense home. Um, yes, you're going to use WaterSense labeled products because the big shift has gone from low flow to high efficiency. And EPA has done a lot of work with the um, manufacturers to make sure that they're actually getting this very high delivery um, um, experience, but low water usage. Absolutely, you have to you have to do what's it called smart landscaping. In other words, almost like zero scape, zero scaping, and making sure that you're doing things like drip irrigation. Uh, they've got they've even um, reduced the amount of pressure that's coming into the house, so that again, um, you're not blasting the system with very high pressure. Um, and it focuses on hot water distribution. Actually, contrary, in some areas we've been reducing our cost in energy, but in water distribution, we are actually spending more today than we used to. Now, that may also be because we've got um, houses are bigger and typically more bathrooms, and we're going off into uh, multiple um, bathrooms. So here are the benefits, because who cares about the certification? What, am I, what are my benefits? 20% reduction in water usage over a similar house. Um, so if we were looking just at a code-built house and a water sense house, that's a 20% reduction in water usage. That results in about, a, on average, about a $600 savings. Now, when I talk about total cost of ownership, if we look at $600 and we think about um, water utility rates rising and sewage rates rise, rising, we're talking about a significant savings over the life of that mortgage. We're, we're talking into the 20, 20 plus thousand as a savings. Now, I don't know about you, but I could certainly work with 20 additional thousand dollars. What we also have is we have water efficient landscapes. Your choices on existing homes you can go through a retrofit, but it's difficult unless you're going to go down to the studs, quite honestly. Um, but you can certainly, you can change out all your, your fixtures, you can go with water scents, toilets, etc. We've got almost 10,000 um, products, uh, but as you can see, um, EPA has taken this very seriously, and you know, we now got waterless urinals, etc., etc. So 
very readily available. You can find them in Lowe's, Home Depot, you can find it online. WaterSense is very available now. Um, I've given this website, uh, again, sort of what we've got, a water budget tool, which actually is a pretty, pretty good tool. So if you want to figure out, you know, how much water, ideally, if, if you're, again, if you're in sort of design phase. Um, and then resources for plumbers. And also if you're rethinking your landscaping, they've got a landscaping water budget tool. So some, some pretty cool um, resources. These are the WaterSense verifiers because the key point on the certification is it's a third party verified. Uh, so um, they are trained um, in the WaterSense program and can advise if you want to do like a retrofit but also if you want to start introducing friends, family, builders, um, et cetera, they should know who to work with. That was a bit quick, but I was very cognizant that <laughs> it's the end of a long night. You guys have been great. Um, so this is sort of basically wrap up on questions and happy to take any um, questions. We stunned them into silence. <laughs> Any questions? Yes. Yes. I don't know, but if it's if um, they're probably going to work it like the, I know they're doing this water sense and build green together mm -hmm. at the moment, so I would imagine it's quite a small add-on. Probably, I, 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 you'd have to ask him. I don't know that. But I wouldn't imagine it'll be a large amount. And, you know, you yourself can go out and if you want to start just using water sense products and changing out aerators and, um, and adding in faucets, it'll start showing a significant difference. Anything else? Great. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and as I say, avail yourself of those um, incentives and rebates on the systems because um, water storage is the issue that we're facing. Great. Thank you. Store it while store it. Store it while store it. So you can use it. <laughs>